Part 1B, this is the coveted systematic approach to answering questions that I teach. I cannot emphasize enough how imperative it is that this becomes habit. So much so that I coined this lecture the golden ticket to success. So please follow along closely. Tackling a question. How do we go in a stepwise fashion through every single question? Again, when you get questions wrong, you've got to know at which step of the process did I get this wrong? What information did I miss? What did I not read? Hold yourself accountable for every single step. It's just like going through an EKG. There's a stepwise fashion to it. If you tackle every question the same every time, you can coach yourself through what you did wrong and start fixing some of the mistakes. First thing you're going to do is you're going to read the question, not the stem, just the question. That gets you in the ballpark. We'll just go through these briefly and then I'll explain them. Then you're going to classify the answer choices. What even are we dealing with? What area of medicine? Then you look at any imaging that you might have. Then you look at labs. Then you look at the last couple lines to kind of see, you know, if anything's popping out. At that point, you finally read the prompt and highlight, and then you start ruling answer choices in and out. So we're going to walk through each one of these individually. Importantly, educated guessing, acute versus chronic. A lot of the times, the question will give you a time frame that this new chief complaint has been around. If they've been taking lisinopril for 30 years and they've got this new cough for a week, maybe it's not the lisinopril. And then process. If you've got all sorts of different answer choices, you know, and one of them is an antibiotic, and based on the question stem, you're really thinking that this is probably an infectious process, maybe go with the antibiotic. So starting off, read the question. This is the last line of the stem. What is the next best step? This will be the most frequently asked question. When I started taking these tests and answering these questions, I thought that this was asking, hey, student Dr. Bernard, what's your opinion on the matter? You know, taking all things into consideration, what do you really think is the best thing to do here? Super wrong. Totally terrible way to go about it. What this is asking is, you remember on that previous page, treatment is one of the fingerlings of each disease. They are literally asking step one, two, three, four, whatever of each disease process. Where are we in the treatment process? A lot of the times they'll tell you, hey, we tried step one, this patient didn't respond. So all they're asking is what's the next line in, of treatment? What's step number two? That's all they're asking you. Once you've got your diagnosis and you figured out that, hey, we tried step number one for treatment previously, step number two is all they're asking. That's all they're asking you. There's no subjectivity here needed whatsoever. So base this purely on treatment regimen and indications. What's the diagnosis? That one is a lot more straightforward. You know that, okay, I'm going to have to read this stem and I know kind of what bias I'm going to need to read it on because I'm going to look at the answer choices. Uh, which of the following is caused by this medication? This is a great one because a lot of the times you read that, you look in the previous sentence, it says something, something with Cinepril, and in the, uh, the answer choices, you see cough. You might already have the answer to this question, and you haven't spent the precious seconds reading the stem. Now, I'll state again, I'm a slow test taker. I use every second on these exams, so time for me is important. All right, so after we read this question and we know, all right, what am I trying to figure out? You read the answer choices. Is it five antibiotics? Is it procedures? Um, sometimes you'll get lucky and it's ethics answers. The reason that's important is they'll give you this long stem about some traumatic event and this, this patient had this type of surgery and had these subsequent diagnoses and they take, take them back to the OR and you're sitting here trying to work through all the types of shock that they've been in and out of, and turns out it's a question about living will. You're just figuring out what you're dealing with. What information do I need to set these apart? So when you look at these answer choices, you might see five cardiac medications, okay? And it says, which of the following is the best next step? Okay, so based on these five cardiac drugs, I need to know... I really need to know what disease we're dealing with, but I need to know heart rate. I need to know blood pressure. I'm, I'm not going to give a contraindicated drug in those scenarios. That's when you start ruling things in and out. 
So by looking at the answer choices and seeing, oh, hey, it's five drugs. Okay, how do I determine which one of these will be the right answer? Just just by asking questions about these answer choices. That's important because here in a second, you're going to read the stem. And that's when you are going to glean the information that you need to differentiate these answer choices. It's a different way to think about it than just reading the question and answering it. It's an objective, tactical approach. Third, you look at the imaging. Sometimes it's super obvious. You might have a mid-humerus fracture and, oh, hey, I remember that's the radial nerve. And you see radial nerve as an answer and voila. Sometimes it's really simple. Next, we look at labs. Labs are key. Labs can be your best friend. You have to go through labs every single time. You'll get faster at it. You'll get better. It becomes easier. Labs are objective. They might be the most objective thing on the test. You can't argue against labs and vital signs, but labs especially. Okay, You and your new mouse are going to highlight every single abnormal lab. Low is low, high is high. If the potassium is a tenth of a point too low, you highlight it. Uh, reason being, yes, it's hypokalemia. Are we going to treat it? Not necessarily. What a lab value at that, like, well, it's questionably low. That tells me that there's another red flag somewhere on this page. And usually if you go looking, you'll find it. Same thing with blood pressure. If you're not sure whether or not it's hypotension, if, well, it's 104 over 72. It's kind of, it's kind of borderline. When they want to give you a patient with hypotension, it's going to be 80 over 50. Back to labs, highlight every single abnormal lab, low is low, as high is high. If you don't know the normal range for the lab, absolutely right now, look it up. You have to use the resource that's on the page. It's free points if you are looking it up and keeping track of it. You'll get faster at recognizing what normal is. You'll get faster at looking them up. I can't tell you how many times I got burned on stuff like albumin and creatinine for some reason, especially albumin, trying to tell me, well, you know, what the status of this person's liver is, and I would just would totally miss it. So always look that stuff up. It's free points. Highest yield labs, I'd say sodium, potassium, glucose, of course, white blood cell counts, and H&H. &H. White blood cell count is really telling you Yes, there's an infectious process, or no, there's not. Glucose, hypo versus hyperglycemia. Uh, potassium, typically cardiac. And sodium, that massive flow chart that we saw earlier. Pro tip, one of my students taught me last year, if it's high, they'd highlight the value. So they might highlight the value over here on the right. If the value is low, they highlight the name over here on the left. The last couple lines. Once in a while, this will give you a really big buzzword or clue as to what's going on. It might be trachea deviated to the left side. Well, that's a very few specific amount of things. Uh, patients diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. The stem is going to give me this long convoluted story about her neurologic symptoms. And then at the very end, they're going to tell me the diagnosis is a mess. What do you want to do about it? It'll save you some time. Um, or, you know, the mother states the infant tolerates honey. And sometimes it's nothing. Sometimes it says physical exam and vitals are negative and benign and there's no helpful information. All right, so next we're into reading the prompt and highlighting. This is your most powerful tool in all of test taking. And the reason being, it's black and white. It's binary. Our new thought process is objective. Things either are or are not indicated or suggested by this by this stem by this question highlighting is you telling future you here in about 20 or 30 seconds this is important this is what it is if you're highlighting a vital sign because it's low you're telling yourself this patient's hypotensive blood pressure 70 over 30 you cannot forget that use the highlighting to tell yourself what is and is not important, and, and don't second guess that. You have to highlight all abnormals, unless it's like an ethics question, or it's just purely not pertinent to the question at hand, which is not often, but we'll go through questions and do some examples of that. But highlighting all abnormals, patient has shortness of breath, 
Always highlight the chief complaint. Sometimes age is important. Duration is important. What other signs and symptoms do they have? Vital signs, things like that. Highlight all pertinent normals. So if your patient's coming in, uh, they have lungs, you know, cleared of auscultation, but the chief complaint is shortness of breath, that's pointing you in the direction of a very, you know, very few things. You know, it's probably not asthma or pneumonia. I'm thinking more like PE. Is there a chest pain associated? You start formulating more questions on your own. But again, you're highlighting those pertinent normals. So if one of the answer choices is pneumonia or bronchitis with clear lungs to auscultation, this isn't clinic. There's no gray area. I'm sticking with my guns. Highlight strange info. So I don't always highlight meds, but if I've looked at the answer choices beforehand and they all look like side effects, I might be highlighting the medications. You're using the highlighting to help remove all the subjectivity from your decision making. We're trying not to be subjective here. We're trying to be objective. Highlighting is objective. Highlighting abnormals is objective. Highlighting pertinent normals is objective. You're telling yourself a story and you're building this presentation for the answer. What do you think the answer is at this point? And why is it those things and why is it not those things? Rule in and rule out based on information you've come across. Okay, I, I saw that the patient was hypotensive at 70 over 40. I'm not going to discharge him home. I'm going to get rid of that one. Okay, I see that this patient has a fever. Maybe they have pneumonia after all. You know, they're post-op patient or they're, you know, they just gave birth or whatever other inciting event is taking place and they've got this fever and this tachycardia. I'm concerned. If the patient has no fever and is normotensive and has a regular heart rate and rhythm, I'm probably not thinking sepsis. So you're ruling yourself in and out based on what you've highlighted, what you've looked at in the question. Review your highlights, put the big picture together. Again, normal tensive, no fever, it's probably not sepsis. Go with what you know. Practice, practice, practice this technique. The order and flow should become second nature to you as you develop the habit. Next, I'll go through a couple questions with this method for your example.